concepts like democracy, secularism, universal adult franchise, all these were foreign concepts when they came here. And so we can see that India over a period imbibed a number of values and thinking that were once considered foreign. Probably the most serious accusation uh, all people involved with the Christian work face is the charge of conversion. And this is even in the comments to the article I wrote, I could see that uh, it just saying that everything is a ploy to convert. Politicization of conversion has happened in India probably like it has not happened anywhere else. And so the question is how can we depoliticize conversion? India became independent, the missionaries left and uh, and the responsibility of the church became uh, went into the hands of the Indian Indians itself. So caste came back in all its ugliness. Same denomination, the same denomination having two churches side by side in the same area, one for the uh, uh, so-called upper caste Christian, other for the Dalit Christian. So this has been really a scandal, a scandal on the witness of the Indian church. Hi there, welcome to the Carpenter's Desk. Today I am glad to have with me Dr. Yesudas Atyal. He is an Indian academic and scholar. He is the acquiring editor for Fortress Press in the areas of world Christianity, world religions, and South Asian and Indian scholarship. Formerly, uh, he was the visiting researcher at the University School of Theology in Boston University. He has authored, co authored, or edited numerous books, including Understanding World Christianity. India, Religion in Southeast Asia, an Encyclopedia of Faith and Cultures, and the Oxford Encyclopedia of South Asian Christianity. He occasionally contributes to op-eds and articles for several news media outlets, with the most recent one being Christianity hasn't failed in India, conversion isn't its only goal. This was for the print, which is an excellent analysis of Christianity's influence and achievements in India. You can find the link to that article in the description. Welcome, Dr. Atiyal, to the Carpenter's Desk. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a joy and a pleasure for me to be here with you. I'd heard, I'd heard much about the work of the Carpenter's Desk, and uh, it's a great joy for me to be uh, uh, here uh, talking to you now. Asher John, uh, I've, been, I've been talking to you in, in recent days, and I was quite impressed by the way you and your colleagues carry on your work. So thank you very much for inviting me to be he here and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you, Dr. Atiyah. It's a pleasure and an honor for uh, us to have you on this podcast. And for our viewers, if you're actually interested in such conversation, you can look at the look at, look at our playlist called Conversations at the Desk. You can also subscribe and tap the bell icon for more such content, apologetics content and resources. So today we are going to have a very interesting conversation that is placed in the Indian context. Uh, we will be discussing, uh, you know, Christianity's influence in India's social justice movement. So Dr. Atiyal, we can actually start with a broad overview, right? Uh, could you briefly give a broad overview of India's social justice movements at large and how we should approach and evaluate Christianity's presence and influence in them? Sure. It's, uh, it's indeed important uh, that we talk about the background to the, um, the participation of Christianity in uh, India's uh, social justice movements. And, uh, and sometimes um, um, it is said that uh, Christianity or Christian missionaries were the first uh, agents that influence the uh, social justice movement in India. That is not that's not entirely right. There were uh, several currents uh, that went uh, before Christianity uh, in India. Uh, there were several uh, uh, ideologies, religions there. There 
uh, for instance, Buddhism. Uh, Buddhism predates predates Christianity by several centuries. Buddhism uh, started in India. It is believed that uh, uh, Buddha, the founder, lived uh, in India. You know, Buddhism, uh, Buddhism could be perhaps the foremost um, of um, the movements or ideologies that stood for a radical social transformation because Buddhism was a strong, strong anti-caste movement, stood against the caste system and, um, and stood for a change in the traditional Hindu religion. Probably that was the reason why uh, Baba Sahib Ambedkar who was a, who is considered the savior of the um, Dalits in India? Uh, at the time when he said that uh, we were born in Hinduism, but we will not uh, die as Hindus, and they considered a number of options to move out of Hinduism and join another phase, and they they eventually uh, chose Buddhism and became neo. Buddhist, with this uh, large number of followers, he followed Buddhism. So Buddhism was certainly a foremost uh, ideology that stood for social transformation. There was also Jainism. Jainism also has several parallels with uh, yeah, Buddhism in that it stood for a uh, uh, casteless society and the radical transformation society. Now these, both Buddhism and Jainism, moved out of Hinduism, but within the Hindu fold itself, there was Charvaga, Charvaga materialism, that also uh, long, long before the modern rationalist movement, materialistic ideologies came, Charvaga materialism stood uh, for a change. And then there was the Bhakti tradition, the Bhakti tradition that emerged in the medieval era. Uh, focused on love and devotion to religious concepts, and um, and so so the bhakti movement also preached against the caste system and uh, used the local languages instead of any sacred language, and and in uh, Islam, the yes, Sufism was there. Sufism and the bhakti movement went side by side. Uh, Sufism was focused on Islamic mysticism. And so you had a number of uh, uh, social justice movements that preceded Christianity. And while talking about Islam and reformist Islam, we have to remember the name of Asghar Ali Engineer, who passed away a few years ago. And his work is still carried out in Mumbai by his son and others. And so therefore, we need to keep the, the long tradition of uh, social reform movements and progressive uh, thinking that uh, that went went ahead and that provided a space for the christian missionaries and indian christians committed to social change to come and occupy the place you have actually spoken about a few indigenous movements like buddhism and jainism that fought against uh, you know the evils in the society that fought for a casteless society and now but most of the time, you know, Christianity is often portrayed as a Western import that was foreign to our culture. So can you actually describe some salient points about the history of Christianity's presence and coexistence in India? Is there, um, you know, is there an incompatibility, so to speak, between Christian faith and Indian culture at large? An interesting question, because can be uh, addressed in a number of ways. First of all, we need to ask uh, what is for how do you define foreign and indigenous, especially in this era of globalization and uh, liberalization? What is foreign? And we talk about the whole world as a global village. So how do you, and, and there is easy travel and communication across countries, across continents. So what is really foreign and what is indigenous? How do you, how do you distinguish between foreign and indigenous would be an interesting question. And we also, and we also need to remember that uh, concepts like uh, democracy, secularism, universal adult franchise, all these were foreign concepts when they came here. And so we can see that India over a period imbibed a number of 
values and thinking that were once considered foreign but uh, now that has been uh, that has been a part of our culture or society now talking about christianity christianity is believed to have been uh, here for a long time probably from the uh, first century or certainly the first few centuries there's been a strong presence of christianity in india with the st thomas tradition and also the persian persian connection uh, that was there now talking about um, uh, various major stages of indian christian even though i'm not a historian probably i could briefly uh, briefly touch upon some of the major um, uh, phases uh, periods in uh, indian christianity of course of course the st thomas tradition is there and we are well aware of it uh, but there is unfortunately not much documentation on it uh, certainly not from the early early one or two or three centuries and since then it is known to have developed contact with persian and other cultures from abroad but of course a major breakthrough happened uh, with the arrival of the portuguese and vasco da gama who came in uh, 1498 and for the first time the frontiers of christianity was extended beyond the st thomas community to a larger group that was there now while talking about the portuguese presence and portuguese influence on the on indian christianity a major event as we all know as students of history know was the synod of dymfor the synod of dymfor in 1599 when a portuguese archbishop menses convened the uh, synod and uh, following the synod the church mostly then in the uh, southeastern uh, sorry southwestern part of india which is now known as kerala so the church was brought under the control of the roman catholic church up till then the church was largely independent but uh, following the synod of dymfor uh, the church was brought uh, under the catholic domain uh, there was strong resistance among the st thomas christians to the roman control and in 1653 an oath was taken by a section to be free of the roman domain and this and this oath is known as the cunin cross oath and the mainland church history would tell us that uh, this incident of uh, popularly known as the cunin cross oath marked the liberation of the church from western domination so that is a mainline thinking but there are different uh, versions to it uh, and different voices have been coming coming secular voices have been coming subaltern voices that challenge the the reading that uh, the synod of dymfor took the indian church to the western fold and that the cunin cross oath uh, brought it uh, uh, back into the indian fold so several scholars challenge that and one of them is uh, vijay kumar uh, he says that uh, the synod marked the starting point of an anti caste movement within the church in india and before the arrival of the portuguese the st thomas christians were believed to have followed like upper caste hindus a caste system and norms of untouchability and also had the oppression of the lower caste people untouchables in this context archbishop menses attempted to purge the st thomas christians of their hindu values and to make them real christians and um, and he opposed untouchability and the synod tried to bring in a number of uh, social reform movements now dalit christians dalit historians today ask whether the resistance of the st thomas christians was to foreign control or to making the church open to people of all castes it is significant that in order to extricate themselves from the hands of the jesuits uh, the thomas christian sought ali sought 
sought the allegiance of the Patriarch of Antioch, under whose dominion the St. Thomas Christians continued for several more centuries as high caste churches. That the fellowship in Christ did not enable the uh, Thomas, Thomas Christians to transcend caste barriers has been underscored by several other historians too. And uh, another uh, historian who has commented on this is Leslie Brown, uh, who later became Bishop, uh, Bishop Bishop Leslie Brown. He was saying it was in consequence of the place which the community occupied and accepted in the Hindu caste structure of India that the observed untouchability with respect to the outcast groups like the Hindus and never attempted to bring their non-Christian neighbors to the knowledge of Christ and so into the Christian church. So the traditional Thomas Christians conducted themselves more as a caste group who did not have any concern for the people outside that outside them. It's also significant that uh, several mainline historians, church historians, agree with the Dalit rereading of history. According to Matthias Mundaren, Matthias Mundaren is perhaps the foremost uh, church historian in the 20th century. According to Matthias Mundaren, it, is, um, it, it was the coming of the Portuguese and the first contact with them in the early 16th century, which helped the ancient Christians of India to break through their traditional pattern of life and enter into a meaningful communication with the world Christianity. And the initial encounter with Western Christianity set the pace for their history in succeeding decades and centuries. And the most significant change perhaps was that this encounter with the foreigners compelled the Indian church to redefine its cultural and religious identity as a caste-based community. So subsequently we read that the Portuguese missionaries and others uh, with them turned their attention to the Dalits and the people who live on the coastal areas and the other marginalized communities. And so even though the focus of the Portuguese was initially the traditional St. Thomas Christians, uh, once the Thomas Christians uh, rejected them in the Cone and Cross Oath, or at least a substantial number of the Thomas Christians rejected them, the Portuguese uh, uh, worked among the Dalits and people in the coastal areas and the other marginalized groups. It's important to note, note that the, protest, the Protestant churches, the Protestant Christianity also traveled along parallel lines. The first Protestant missionaries in India were two German missionaries from Halle, uh, Halle that the Bartholomew Ziegenbalg and Henry Kluge. Ziegenbalg and Kluge responded to the appeal of King Frederick of Denmark to establish a mission for the uh, natives living in the Danish East India Company colony of Trangabar. Trangabar is in Tamil Nadu. They reached Trangabar uh, in 1706 and uh, worked among them, mostly, mostly in the Tamil area. And about a hundred years later, William Carey, uh, Carey, Joshua Marshman, and William Ward arrived uh, uh, on the uh, arrived initially in Kolkata, uh, which was then the capital of East India Company. Then they moved to Sarambur. Sarambur is a town about 35 kilometers away from Kolkata, partly because uh, they were not welcomed by the British rulers. And uh, Sarambur, like Trankabar, was a Danish colony, and they felt uh, free to uh, practice. Uh, their faith and also mission work in um, in uh, Sarambur, based in Sarambur. Mm. And of course, eventually the Sarambur College and other work came up there. Uh, mm. Now, it was also in the early 19th century that the Church Missionary Society, CMS, CMS work, started in Kerala. Uh, they came as a mission of help, to help the St. Thomas Christians. But, um, 
but after after a few decades of association the st thomas christian sh sh showed them the door and said no we don't need you thank you uh, you can leave it was then that they focused their attention on the dalits and tribals and started working among them so therefore we can see that uh, both the catholic and the protestant missions in india initially focused on the uh, privileged the privileged st thomas christians but uh, once it became difficult for them to work there they moved into the into the peripheries among the uh, marginal uh, communities uh, this we can see that um, you know caste caste exclusiveness the practice of untouchability and the lack of christian mission all went together and the rigidity of caste in the uh, church was challenged initially by the portuguese and then by both uh, church missionary society and london missionary society cms and lms and the missionaries combined there it was then that they moved to the marginal people yeah yeah thanks uh, thanks for that wonderful description there so I, you've already mentioned about the indigenous you know when you're talking about christianity's influence you, you should talk about the indigenous and the you know, foreign uh, missionaries so what are the what are to start with what are some of the crucial contributions of foreign missionaries in india and how did they identify with the indian culture at large i mean uh, for the viewers this is an inter interesting point that dr atiyal notes in his article where he talks about how missionaries are identified and you actually speak about how they refined indian languages and translated some of the you know uh, notable indian epics and works of literature etc could you just briefly outline them for us yeah sure uh, of course the work of the missionaries uh and at the social level social transformation was broadly in three areas social reform education and uh, medical care health care social reform uh, certainly was quite prominent especially in uh, bengal uh, and in other places the work for for the abolition of sati sati uh, some of our um, uh, viewers may know is the practice of uh, uh, wife a widow of a man who died jumping into the funeral pyre yeah, where her husband's uh, body is kept so so there was this uh, terrible inhuman practice of sati infanticide also slavery and there uh, and and so these were the uh, uh, unjust inhuman uh, programs activities that the social uh, missionaries try to uh, counter and in kerala dr mohandas wallika who is actually a secular secular historian talks about the work of the missionaries in in, in the upper cloth upper cloth revolt that till about the 19th century women of most caste except the brahmin women could not cover their chest and um, and and could not use cloth on the upper part of their body and for the first time uh, the local people saw the mission or the people with the missionaries wearing proper clothes uh, covering their uh, chest and all and that that facilitated the upper cloth movement in kerala which became a major part and this was re recorded by dr mohan das uh, who is a secular historian so and and of course so social reform a level it was quite prominent also in the level of education a number of uh, you know schools colleges across the country also health care as there but what i want to briefly touch upon is the uh, work of the missionaries in the area of language language and literature printing and translation broadly the renaissance re of the languages we have a prominent uh, historian named babu vargis now babu vargis has been doing a lot of study on the contribution of uh, missionaries to uh, linguist uh, language language renaissance and the uh, way the languages were developed because because a, <clears throat> because a charge the christians generally hear 
is that uh, missionaries destroyed the Indian culture and the missionaries contributed to that. Actually, Babuari says it is just, just the opposite. Just the opposite and the missionaries contributed enormously to building up the Indian culture in several ways. Now, there was a not, I mean, Hindi language was not the way it is today. It was largely several 12 or so Boli dialects that was being used. And, and missionaries contributed to unifying and um, uh, the Hindi language. And in 1880, they wrote a book of grammar for Hindi. And the Hindi Prajarak Samadhi was started by the missionaries. And so there, there's a number of ways in which they contribute to the development and unification of the languages. It's also said that there are about 1,653 languages or dialects in India. But out of that, only about 200, 230 have, have the script, the modern script. And most of this, most of the script was developed by the missionaries. And so the uniformity of the languages and script was done largely by them. And they work in modern dictionaries, encyclopedias, prose, travelogue, grammar books, newspapers, and printing. All, all these were pioneering contributions in several ways. Now, we, now I mentioned earlier that William Carey, uh, who was in West Bengal, uh, translated both the Ramayana and Mahabharata into Bengali language, and uh, and and that was done by so so the work of the missionaries was not only in the area of uh, preaching the gospel, but the large scale um, uh, uh, renaissance of the language. And so what this led to is that uh, people had access to the language. Because so far only the upper caste people, only the Brahmins could read and write and knew uh, the script well. The common people did not know. But uh, for the first time, uh, ordinary people uh, had uh, access to language. Language became people oriented and democratic. Uh, and of course in Kerala, the missionary Benjamin Bailey set up the first printing press in Malayalam, and he was the first lexiographer in the language. And Herman Gunter edited the first Malayalam English dictionary. And so it can be, it can be argued that the primary objective of the missionaries was conversion. And, and that is not something that we can gloss over. At the same time, their work was also for the renewal of the language and literature was a major uh, part of it. Another important element of the uh, uh, renaissance of language was translation. The translation was a major work that was uh, done uh, in several uh, levels by the missionaries. There is a great um, uh, American scholar, African-American scholar called Laman, Laman Sane. Laman Sane was originally from Ghana, but he worked in the US practically most of his life. Yale was a professor at Yale University and died just a couple of years ago. And main focus of Laman Sane's monumental critique of mission and colonialism, colonialism and mission is the recognition that translation and vernacular renewal played a crucial role in not only the spread of uh, the Christian mission in the non-Western world, but in the liberation of the indigenous people as well. And the fact that this fact is also recognized in India. Analyzing the work of William Carey and the Sarambo mission, which he led in relation to Bengali cultural renaissance of the 19th century, especially the development of the Bengali language. M.M. Thomas says uh, they were vernacularists in the 19th century debate about the medium of education, unlike, un, un, unlike the Anglicans who suppressed the local culture. And so there was a distinction between the uh, missionaries and the Anglicists. 
the Ang Anglican. Anglicans were the ones who focused on the study of English language as such. Um, and so they, they suppressed or mostly even, even the colonial rulers, British colonial rulers, suppressed the indigenous, the local languages, focused on English, but the missionaries worked for the uh, specifically focusing on the development of the indigenous uh, languages and culture, and and so and so unfortunately, uh, this has not been carried on in the current times because he goes on to say that uh, that I'm talking about um, Imam Thomas. Perhaps a good deal of the religious fundamentalism and communal passion which bedevil public life even today may be a continuation of the people's revolt against the earlier neglect of their traditional cultures. In contrast, the Sarambur mission emphasized vernacular languages as a sphere of intense cultural interaction between Western culture, Christian religion, and India. And in this context, it is unfortunate that in our times, uh, India, Indian church's concentration is on English medium education alone. Uh, and so to some extent, the vernacular languages and cultures are being uh, marginalized. Uh, yes. Yeah, so that's a lot of history that you covered. And very interesting how you know, a lot of things you covered. And in fact, in your article also, you mentioned uh, some lesser known details, like, you know, how William Carey, you know, he um, transferred Translated the Ramayana and Mahabharata, which was a very interesting uh, fact to mention. And I, I think these are facts that are not spoken out loud. You know, it's often seen that missionaries were and were enemies of India's cultural history. So you actually gave a brilliant response there. Thank you for that. And now we've actually spoken about foreign missionaries. Let's move to some indigenous movements. And I want to hear you on that a little. So when you talk about India's uh, nationalist movement, you know, Indian nationalist movement, can you elaborate the presence and participation of uh, Christianity in India's freedom movement? That's a, that's a very important question because one of, uh, one of the reasons for the accusation that Christianity is a foreign religion is uh, because uh, people think that um, um, it was just the missionaries alone who worked in India. Actually, we need to focus, we need to remind people that uh, since India became independent 70, 73 years ago, missionaries, missionaries have not been here. It is um, India, Indian Christianity has been built by indigenous Christians. And even much before, much before the missionaries left, at least from the 19th century onwards, indigenous Indian Christian leadership has been there. And there's been several Indian Christian leaders who participated in the nationalist movement at the, at the time when uh, India's freedom struggle was going on. There's a number of Indian Christian initiatives that were there. And probably the oldest such venture was, um, was the periodical, the Christian Patriot, which is a journal of social and religious progress started by some Indian Christians. And this journal, the Christian Patriot, was started in 1890, so long before uh, India became independent. Even while the missionaries were around, this was a completely Indian initiative, nothing to, nothing to do with the missionaries, such as, because this journal was launched in the, in the 19th century. 1890. And the journal's name signified its agenda as Christians to be engaged in the uplift of the nation in times of a growing Indian nationalism. And different from other journals, the Christian Patriot was started as a purely indigenous venture. And the journal criticized both missionary paternalism and racism and racism on the one hand, and tendencies in sections of the Indian National Congress to equate the national cause with the Hindu revivalism. And so the newspaper Christian Patriot uh, attacked uh, both the friends. On the one hand, they questioned the missionary paternalism 
and felt that the missionaries uh, should not be too dominating. And on the other hand, they feel that uh, India's nationalist movement, then represented by Indian National Congress, uh, also sometimes stands for Hindu revivalism. And so there's a danger to counter uh, Hindu revivalism also. So this newspaper was probably the first instant, the first voice of uh, Indian Christians. But since then, um, maybe from that time on, there are a number of individual Indian Christians, people like Bengal Chakraya, uh, P. P. Chanjaya, S. K. George, and others who participated in the freedom struggle, who were closely associated with that. And there were Western missionaries also, who were very much part of the nationalist movement. In my article, I mentioned two of them. One was he of Andrews, who was a close uh, friend of uh, Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi. Other was uh, R. R. Keita, who was an American missionary in India. He became so much part of the nationalist movement that the British government threw him out of the country. So he had to leave India, go back to America. And when India became free, of course, the free, free, independent, Indian, Indian leaders welcomed him back and he lived the rest of his life in um, India and died in Tamil Nadu. And so there were a number of, uh, uh, number of uh, such initiatives on the, on the part of the Indian Christians. Now, it is also important to note that practically all these initiatives, all the Indian uh, Christian involvement associations were non non-ecclesiastic in nature. That means it is not the initiative of any Indian church. It was not even supported by church. It was largely a laity, laity movement. And the, and the churches, the institutional churches of India were not a part of that. It was a, it was a non-ecclesiastic uh, movement and often fringe groups, groups on the margins. And this has continued in the independent India also. Very often, very often the initiative for social action doesn't come, for, from, come from organized churches, but from uh, fringe groups, groups in the margins um, here. Yes. So thank you, Dr. Atiyah, for illuminating us on India's, you know, Indian Christianity's, indigenous Christianity's presence in the nationalist movement. Um, but you know, often there's a popular narrative, which is very popular nowadays, that behind all the social outreach and the social justice movement, all of that where Christianity is involved, uh, their main agenda is conversion. Do you agree with that? Is conversion Christianity's primary goal? And I've often heard this allegation that is often brought up against Mother Teresa, for example, even atheists like Christopher Hitch, Hitch, Hitchens, who was a journalist, has alleged that you know her main main agenda was to convert people. How do you actually respond to that? Well, probably, probably the most serious accusation uh, all people involved with the Christian work face is the charge of conversion. And this is even in the comments to the article I wrote, I could see that uh, it just saying that everything is a ploy to convert. So this is a standard, uh, standard criticism. Uh, very often, by those uh, those who, uh, those who don't fully understand um, the process of this. Now there are three things I want to mention. Uh, the first one is that uh, if you take conversion per se, that is conversion conversion by itself outside any inducement or favor, the immediate question is, uh, why not conversion? Why not conversion? Because uh, uh, conversion in the law of the land, the law of the land allows conversion and the Indian constitution allows it. So why not? And you know that all free societies, democracies allow conversion. So sadly in India, conversion has become politicized. So politicization of conversion has happened in India, probably like it has not happened anywhere else. 
And so the question is, how can we depoliticize conversion? Now, while talking on conversion, we must briefly review the debate that happened in the Constituent Assembly. Of course, this is uh, fairly well known and probably I'm repeating something that uh, several of you already know. But, uh, but uh, it is understood that initially in the draft uh, of the Constitution, the right to religion, the freedom of religion, involved only the religion to preach and practice. Now, and that was the time when the Constituent Assembly was discussing communal representation. Communal representation is represent, representation and separate, um, separate um, electorates for different communities. So, so Muslims will have certain number of seats in the parliament or legislative assemblies, Christians will have. So that is called the communal representation. I mean, but the Christians were strongly opposed to it. And Christians said that we don't need any communal representation. And we trust the Indian uh, majority to be fair to us. And they'll be fair to us. And they believe that uh, the right to uh, religion should not be a minority right, it should be a human right. And so, and so the uh, uh, in the drafting of the constitution, and there were two Christian representatives on the constituent assembly, Mr. Mr. S. C. Mukherjee and Jerome de Sousa. Both said that we don't need any special privileges and we don't need any privileges of minorities. So we just want our fair share in India and we uh, trust the uh, majority to be fair to us. Now, that was a magnanimous gesture. It was, it was as a spontaneous response to it that uh, Sardar Vallabhai Patel, who became the uh, first home minister of India, Sardar Patel uh, said that the right to religion should not only be the freedom to preach and practice, but also propagate. And so the element of propagation was also enshrined in the Indian constitution. So this was a covenant, a sacred covenant between Christians and the Indian society, Indian state. So that is, it's very important to remember that it is not a charity uh, uh, and the right to religion, which includes the right for anybody to profess and accept uh, uh, religion of his or her choice is not a charity, charitable thing. It's not a minority right. It is like human right. Uh, it is It is true that, uh, I mean, it, it is in the, very often the charge is that um, uh, conversion through, through inducement, conversion to coercion. Now the law already prohibits that. And, uh, and the law of the land, prohibits the conversion by a coercion or prohibition. I mean, or, 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 or any kind of induce, inducement, favoritism, it's already prohibited. And so it is very sad that in free India uh, from 1980s onwards, several states, I think starting with, the, uh, starting with Orissa, then Madhya Pradesh, other states, passed the so-called Freedom of Religion Act that prohibits that curtails, that severely controls conversion, and so, and so, when we when we are when we are uh, uh, told that or accused of conversion, the first step will be to defend conversion. That conversion is a primary human right of all citizens in India. The freedom to <coughs> choose one's own religion. It's it's a not only used by Christians, all, all religions use conversion. Ambedkar and uh, 450,000 members of the Mahar community joined Buddhism and became neo Buddhist, left Hinduism. So it's not only by Christians alone, but that uh, it's a freedom for all. And, and just as we mentioned now, several Hindu, Hindu missionaries are working in North America and elsewhere. Uh, 
involved in the conversion and several Americans and Europeans are uh, being converted to the Hindu faith. So that is a charge. The conversion is something we need to stand by and we need to affirm as a right. That's my first point. The second, second point that the social outreach program, the charge, that social outreach programs or the Christians are guided by the objective of conversion. That's not really, it's not been proved in history and there's no evidence for that. Probably the place where Christian missions and institutions were very active was West Bengal, of course. Of course, initially till the 19th century, it was just the state of Bengal and now it is West Bengal. Uh, at least for 200 years, for over 200 years, Christian mission, missionaries, others were there. Um, there are uh, two very old Christian theological institutions in uh, uh, West Bengal. Uh, the Bishop's College right in the heart of the Kolkata city and the Sarambo College just about uh, 30 kilometers away. And so Christianity has been very much present there. And you mentioned the example of Mother Teresa. She was she was working in uh, Kolkata for, she worked there for several decades and, um, and the, the missionaries of charity still work there. And, and so there's been sizable uh, Christian activity in West Bengal. But the Christian population of Bengal has not gone up substantially. It is still a small, small percentage of Christians alone. And so there's really not much ground to say that the Christian social outreach, educational, medical, uh, charitable work has been guided by the objective of a conversion alone. And those who studied in Christian you know, top colleges in India, you know, uh, from Delhi, St. Stephen's onwards, uh, many, many leading uh, college, Christian colleges uh, across the country. Uh, there are many leading hospitals are there run by the Christian and community. So far, we have not come across any serious charges of uh, uh, attempts to convert there. And so that is a charge that we need to reject outright. outright. And third, this is important, where in most places, I mean, I would not say everywhere, but in most places where conversion happened, the initiative came not from the missionaries, but from the people, uh, uh, but from the local people. It was the people who approached the missionaries and asked them to come and help. I'll just give one example in Kerala. In, uh, of course, uh, uh, in the central Kerala, in a town uh, called Kote, uh, missionaries, Christian missionaries, CMS missionaries, uh, and we earlier mentioned the Church Missionary Society, CMS missionaries have been active for, for well over 200 years. Uh, and they were based in Kote, the town in central Kerala. Now, uh, some uh, tribal from East Kerala, from the mountainous, mountainous regions of East Kerala came to Kotem. The primary initiative was not that of the missionaries, but that of the local people. So these three points are important. One is that we need to affirm the fundamental right to conversion. Secondly, there is no substantial evidence to prove that um, uh, uh, the social, educational, health work of the missionaries was guided towards conversion. And thirdly, in most places where conversion did happen, it was primarily because of the interest and the initiative of the people, and they approached the missionaries and asked for their help. So these are the points I wanted to say in response to the charge of conversion. Yeah, those are some excellent points. I mean, also you noted what is a very sad truth that uh, conversion is something that is heavily politicized in India today. And we hope that it, you know, uh, it's not the case. And you spoke about conversion being the fundamental right and the examples that you gave about North America and Europe and all such places where conversion is still happening. And so that's a very sad thing. So thank you for those wonderful points there. So conversion is not Christianity's only goal uh, or you know our whatever social um, outreach uh, campaigns that we do 
or our in involvement in these social justice movements conversion is not our only goal then what is the theological basis for social work yeah that is good because uh, the theological understanding of a christian uh, involvement in social action uh, comes from the basic christian understanding that the god is the parent and all human beings are god's children it doesn't distinguish doesn't distinguish between uh, christians and non christians it doesn't distinguish between catholics and protestants there's no distinction there's no qualification god the parent and uh, all people are god's children and so understandably there is a uh, concern to uh, especially when you know that um, certain people certain area certain regions of the world i have a lot of uh, uh, social needs poor people marginalized people it is uh, natural that uh, the work focuses on that probably the christian understanding of uh, uh, god as parent and the equality of children clashed or clashed with the uh, hierarchical caste basis which divided people on the basis of caste several things and so you are either privileged or or a not privileged person and that is not because of anything you did it's just by birth you are you are you are born into a caste and some people are, for, uh, are born outside the caste uh, outcast or untouchable whatever it is so so certainly the christian understanding uh, the theological understanding clashed with the traditional hierarchical caste notion it is there now if we take more more specifically the prophetic prophetic vision of the judeo christian tradition was very important and the, because the prophetic uh, vision of judeo christian tradition focused very sharply on justice so it says that had justice role uh, role like water and righteousness like a never failing stream so there's been a strong prophetic concern for the poor and the weak and the vulnerable people that's the, that is from the hebrew tradition of course in the new testament uh, we speak of the god of grace so so god's god's primary character is grace what is grace unmerited unmerited favor of god unconditional love and so this is the basis of the christian faith on the one hand you have the strong prophetic understanding of justice and uh, and mercy and love and in the new testament you have the god sent an unconditional grace towards uh, humanity so this is so these are the cardinal principles theological understanding on which the church has built now it, it can be asked uh, did the uh, church down the centuries stay with the vision stay with this vision no it did not it drifted away and we know that the church especially in europe became institutionalized huge structures huge centers cathedrals centers and uh, you know bishops art bishops uh, it, it it became a huge institution with a lot of clout money uh, prestige political power and all uh, and drifted away from the core values of the christian faith and therefore from the 17th century onwards of course even before that the protestant protestant movement led by martin luther was there but apart from that uh, in england particularly from the 17th century onwards there were pietistic evangelical uh, movements were there that urged the institutional churches to look beyond themselves so these pietistic evangelical movements in england mainly in the <clears throat> in the context of the church of church of england urge their own church to look beyond them to the poor and the needy and vulnerable in distant places that is from where both the evangelical movement and the ecumenical movement had its origin 
that um, taking the gospel to the uttermost parts of the world and the unity of the whole inhabited world. So, so both uh, both the uh, uh, evangelical and the ecumenical movement have their roots there. So these evangelical groups uh, try to recapture the original vision of the Christian faith. And this is the genesis of the modern modern missionary movement with groups like the London London Missionary Society and the Church Missionary Society that came came to India and the other places. Now they attempted to encounter these these missionary groups, LMS, CMS, other groups. They attempted to encounter caste and build a more democratic and egalitarian society. And also and also as we see now uh, missionaries several missionaries support the nationalist movement also so this is where we could uh, sum up uh, these uh, points yeah, those were some interesting points um, on what motivates christians uh, as a community to engage in social justice movements and social outreach campaigns uh, you've already touched on the fact that how christianity views in fact, something that Paul also says in Acts chapter 17, that we are all his offspring. Uh, so that equality that Christianity grants. Now compare that with what existed in India, what is called a social evil of the caste system. I want you, I want you to comment on how did Christianity unsettle the caste system in India? And how has its ideas and beliefs influenced our <laughs> democracy as a whole based on you know, equality and liberty and fraternity? How was it able to bridge that gap between these uh, different castes that are you know, historically uh, being marginalized? And so I will, I will uh, slightly change the focus of uh, this question because we already found that um, um, uh, missionaries focused on the Dalits and the tribals and the other marginalized sections. Because uh, uh, probably, probably the ones who benefited most from the work of the missionaries were these marginal groups. Uh, but what happened <clears throat> is that uh, once the Indian church, uh, of course, India became independent, the missionaries left, and, uh, and the responsibility of the church became, uh, went into the hands of the Indian, Indians itself. So caste came back in all its ugliness, very sadly. Of course, we can't say that uh, caste was not at all there during the missionary time. It was there <clears throat> and the missionaries tried to keep it at bay or uh, keep it as, as much uh, uh, in control, in check as possible. <clears throat> but, to, but for the Indian Christians to treat all as equal was not that easy. And so you had this uh, uh, difficult scene of uh, uh, cars uh, 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 playing out, especially in the south, because uh, it is in the south uh, uh, that uh, the, the church is relatively strong on the one hand, and secondly, different different castes and communities are in the church, and so you could see this uh, very uh, serious. Uh, uh, phenomena of uh, uh, caste system in the church polarization on the basis of uh, caste and uh, <clears throat> and um, same same denomination the same denomination having two churches side by side in the same area one for the uh, uh, so called upper caste Christians other for the Dalit Christians so this has been really a scandal a scandal on the witness of the Indian church. While Ambedkar was contemplating conversion out of Hinduism, uh, the Christian missionaries approached him and invited him to join the Christian church. And, he's, and he studied Christianity and he felt that, uh, I'm sorry to say that you are cast, cast in the church also. So why should I come there with my followers if caste is already there? <clears throat> so, so the sad reality of uh, independent India, independent uh, church, is the existence of a 
caste system that exists side by side uh, with, uh, with the faith and the practice of the church. <clears throat> Some interesting points that you mentioned there. Um, but you know, before parting, because you have been a scholar who's been studying Christianity in India and Southeast Asia for the last several decades, I want to ask you this question, the current scenario. You know, in the current scenario, how do you evaluate Indian church and Indian Christianity's involvement in the social justice movements? Modern, modern India was built up by, by an organic dialogue between the values of religion and secularism. Now, I will explain that, but this, uh, there were various dialogues uh, that happened side by side simultaneously that all contributed to the building up of modern India. For instance, in Bengal, the, uh, there was a dialogue between the Hindu re Renaissance movement, the Hindu Renaissance movement led by Rajaram, Mohan Roy and others, and, la and later the Brahma Samaj was there in Bengal. And of course, uh, other great uh, thinkers like Rabindranath Tagore. And so that was largely in the context of uh, Bengal. Uh, all of them were Hindus. There was a re re renaissance reform movement within Hinduism in Bengal in the 19th century and later. <clears throat> And the interesting thing is that the missionaries were in dialogue with these uh, uh, Hindu Renaissance leaders, missionaries. Indian nationalism also had two elements. One is the freedom of religion and the other was the freedom from religious discrimination. So these two freedoms are important, the freedom of religion and the freedom from religious discrimination. And these contributed to the building up of modern India. And there was also a commitment to change the traditional structures and cultural values. <clears throat> so this all involved a dialog dialogical relationship at uh, several levels. And as we just now mentioned, uh, there was a dialogue between reformed religion and secularism, between reformed religion and secularism. Nehru, Jawaharlal Nehru, the first prime minister of India, succeeded in codifying the Hindu personal law, laws. And so he could have it, uh, the Hindu personal laws were codified. And the cooperation between Gandhi and Nehru was an excellent example of the dialogue between religion and secularism. Because Gandhi was a staunch uh, believer, uh, Hindu, uh, committed to Hindu, but at the same time interested in reformed Hinduism, uh, felt that uh, there is a room for reform in Hinduism. And Nehru was a non-believer. He was a secular person committed to the development of scientific temper and modernization. But both of them complemented each other. Despite their sharp differences, they worked together to build the uh, modern India, I mean, and the traditional religious views of Mahatma Gandhi <clears throat> and the modern secular scientific view of Nehru. Now, into this dialogue came uh, Ambedkar. Ambedkar said that all this religion and secularism doesn't make any sense without a concern for the marginalized people. And so, Ambedka brought in the perspective of the Dalits into the picture. And he also urged both religion and secularism to be sensitive to the plight of the marginalized people. It was, it was all these organic dialogues at various levels that shaped modern India and was active till uh, active in the early, continued into the early decades of modern India, independent India. <clears throat> At another level, there was also the Christian Marxist dialogue, especially in Kerala. Uh, uh, at, uh, several people participated in the Christian Marxist dialogue. Uh, on the communist side, you have people like um, E.M.F. Nambudiripal, who was uh, the first 
a chief minister of Kerala, and P. Govinda Pudla was a communist ideologue. Thomas Isaac, who is a current finance minister, uh, they were involved in that on the Marxist side. On the Christian side, you had people like a doctor, Dr. M. M. Thomas, uh, Paulus Mar Gregorius of the Indian Orthodox Church, Nainan Koshi, uh, who worked for long in World Council of Churches, and Paulus Mar Paulus, another bishop. So there was this dialogue, and they met met several times, and uh, they they exchanged views and kept their connections open. Now, the tragedy of our times is that uh, <clears throat> these dialogues, all these dialogues have become dormant. So you had the dialogue at the national level uh, between uh, Hindu Renaissance, Hindu reform groups, and uh, Christian leaders, and the dialogue between traditional Hinduism and scientific temper and marginalized people and Christian Marxist dialogue. These dialogues all have become dormant in our times. They have come to a standstill. And uh, probably the last of the Indian religious leaders who had a dialogical re relationship with others and who led the social justice movement was Swami Agnivesh. And he passed away just a few days ago. So you don't really have any kind of um, um, uh, dialogue going on now. Religion, each religion has withdrawn to its private sphere. And so the religions have all withdrawn to their private sphere. And secularism has also become dogmatic secularism, no longer interested in any dialogue with uh, <clears throat> any, any group or anyone. And one theory is that uh, this has, this the privatization of religion and the withdrawal of religion into their own private space and secularism becoming dogmatic has created a vacuum. And into that vacuum has come in religious fundamentalism and communalism. Because there is no relationship, because there's no dialogue across religions, because there's no dialogue between religions and ideologies, there's a spiritual vacuum, and that vacuum has now been occupied by uh, the forces of religious fundamentalism and community. But the unfortunate part of the 21st century is the total privatization of religion, the withdrawal from the public space, there's uh, really not much public commitment. There is no dialogue going on there. And uh, this has brought us to the current tragic uh, context of uh, religious uh, fundamentalism and extremism. So I will stop here. OK, OK, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Yesudas Atiya. We have covered a lot of ground. We did uh, talk about the missionaries. We talked about the indigenous movements, the caste system, uh, you know, the the, uh, the allegations of conversions and all of that. This was a really wonderful and engaging conversations where we have kind of covered a lot of good points and we have actually you know, given a thorough case for Christianity's involvement in India's social justice movement. Thank you, Dr. Yesuda Satyal, for joining us on the Thank Carpenter's you. Test today. Thank you.